You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach, and I feel I have to talk fast because summer is ending fast. I've never sensed a brisker summer. Maybe it's because in our family, we front load the season, heading off on a big trip in early June before the crowds and the heat get too oppressive. Or maybe, as is the reason for so many things, it's just age and the perception that there is less and less time. On that happy note, I want to tell you that today's guest is Chip Fisher, the chairman of Fisher Wallace Laboratories, maker of a therapeutic but drug-free machine that alleviates symptoms of PTSD, insomnia, and depression. Meanwhile, back at headquarters, life has been sweet. My son, the redoubtable Exhibit A, has been back in New York on a work trip, which means he's staying with us which I love. I love to take care of my exhibits and, of course, their exhibits. Whether it's cooking for them, putting out fluffy towels for their use, or just turning on the air conditioner before they show up, it's a warm and happy feeling. So, on to this week's top five. Number one. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love the hybrid stone fruits of summer. I know they're somehow wrong, like having a pet liger, but they just taste so good. Pluots, plumcots, it's not like I'm breeding them or anything. I'm just eating them. They're already made. They're both mixtures of plums and apricots, and some people like one more than the other. Of course, there's probably a fight on some place in the deep internet about which is better, pluot or plumcot. Apparently, the difference is the percentage of plum and the percentage of apricot. Plumcots were invented a long time ago by the great American botanist and agricultural scientist called Luther Burbank, I'm sure you've heard of him, who gave us many species of fruit, vegetables, and flowers. Anyway, nectarine, schmectarine. I eat them and love them, and they are a big part of why I love the summer. Number two, poetry. Yes, I said poetry. Sometimes it's hard to read. Yes, you sometimes have to be in the right mood, which is hard to be in. But poetry is a powerful art form, and I think it's good for our souls. I don't have a study to prove that, but hear me out. To really focus on what is written, you have to tune everything else out, which is good for us. If you prefer, you can listen to poetry instead. You can hear it online, which is easy and also great and effective. On the Poetry Foundation website, which I have linked to on my website, there's a poem of the day that you can listen to, as well as a treasure trove of other verse. You might listen to Erica Jong read her own poem called Poetry is Better Than Xanax. Just read one a day, maybe part of your meditation or intense setting. Poetry is like vegetables. It's good for you. Did you know that I wrote poetry in college? Yes, I did. Number three, I shared with you how excited I am about the forthcoming movie sequel to the series Downton Abbey. Today, I join that with the anticipation of the next season of The Crown. For those of you who are not already fans of the actress Olivia Colman, the star of The Favorite, she was last year's Best Actress Oscar winner. I predict you will be a fan of her soon. She takes over from the magnificent Claire Foy as Queen Elizabeth in her middle years. I have never seen a production for television with such lavish production values and extraordinary attention to detail. Awaiting this pleasure will sustain me through the next few months. I'm not asking for much. I just want the crown. Number four. Kim France discussed in her top five, and I need to reiterate, and here it is, number four, the Amazon series Fleabag, which is terrific. And, you know, I'm still finding people who haven't seen Shtissel, so I'll just put in a little word for Shtissel. If you haven't watched Shtissel yet, you are missing out. But this time, I want to talk about Fleabag. It took me a few episodes to get into it, especially as the title character is cranky, not a very sympathetic person, and angry. 
But Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who wrote the show and stars in it, is too smart to create a one-dimensional character, and she certainly doesn't let Fleabag off the hook. The cast of supporting actors do a lot of heavy lifting, and they are all, especially Olivia Colman, fantastic. Number five, the beach. I've been to the beach three or four times this summer, besting last year's record of, I think, one and a half days on the beach. Oh, it was so wonderful. Most recently, we got to spend an afternoon on the strictly beach pass monitored Lucy Vincent Beach on Martha's Vineyard. People who have parking pass for Lucy Vincent tend to be obsessive and very snobby about their beach. Though the water was too cold for me, the breezes and the company of my brother, sister-in-law, and nephew were all I needed. Thank you to them. And now, in the studio with me today is my old, old friend, Chip Fisher. Yes, he is a young man's name, but he is a big grown-up job. He's the chairman of Fisher Wallace Laboratories, which produces a cranial electrotherapy stimulation device that was cleared by the FDA in 1991 for the treatment of depression, anxiety, and insomnia. The primary symptoms of PTSD as well as non-medication relief of pain. Chip. Lisa. I've known you since nursery school. That's right. We are neighbors. I have the picture of you in your mom's silver cross pram sitting in the William Greenberg bakery window etched in my head. Oh, that's wonderful. I, ha- I, You know, I've lost that picture. I don't know where it is. I gave it. I blew it up, gave it to William Greenberg. They put it in the window, and I, I can't find the original. So if you... I think it's still in their window. Is it really? I have to go look. I think it is. Uh, next time you're over there, we grew up when New York was a completely different city. And one thing I love when we get together is we, <laughs> we whine about <laughs> how lovely the city was when we grew up in the 60s, which was really, and I want the listeners to understand, when we talk about our life in the 1960s, it will sound to you like the 1940s. Yes. It, it, it feels, felt like Greenwich today. <laughs> <laughs> it, fe- it felt like we knew the shoemaker. We knew the doorman on the avenue. We grew up a block apart. We, we knew Lisa, the Lisa thi- was truly the girl next door. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And there were, there, but New York, Fifth Avenue was a two way avenue. I mean, people don't remember that. They don't remember that there was a Schraffs everywhere. They don't remember that people were polite. I used to, I also remember uh, the names of all the guys who used to mug me in the neighborhood. Well, and that was because a you, different form of familiarity. <laughs> you have a gift for names. That's why. <laughs> it wasn't the safest of cities, but it was authentic. And by the way, there were bookstores everywhere. Yes, I love that. I love the Lenox Hill bookstore. I love 999 bookstore. And the big ones in, in Midtown. Too. Double and Day Double and Brentano's Day. and Scribner's. Yes, you could walk down Fifth Avenue from 57th Street all the way to 42nd, and there must have been at least 10 bookstores and, and many more on the side streets Right, and, that and specialized in different things. That's right, and the Coliseum Bookstore by Columbus Circle. And it was, it was, you know, in the old days, children, before people played on their phones, people actually read books. Yes. And at some of those bookstores, especially Lenox Hill and 999 on Madison Avenue, uh, this sounds like the whitest first world conversation ever, but what the hell? The the uh, people who worked in the store would wear white coats over their tie and jacket or their dresses because they it felt like they were diagnosing. Oh, or Burlington Bookstore. Remember Burlington? Yes. And they would say, well, you liked that book by Curtis about the Civil War nurses. You might be interested in the book by Abrams about the Vietnam War nurses. I mean they they, they, right. they would recommend things to you. It's incredible. There was great there were great connections between people. Yes. And and the and the retail stores generally in New York were much quirkier when we grew up. 
you yes. can start something and do something very odd. And there, there are a few places left, very few. In fact, in the neighborhood that we grew up, there's this woman who runs a hobby store that's been there for 40 or 50 years, and she just hangs on selling models. But, but That most store her, is still there? Yes, but most of her um, uh, customers are adults, not not kids. Oh, of course. Because their kids are too busy to sit down and actually put a battleship together. Uh, so yeah. it's all, it's us, <laughs> people our age going Reliving our past glory. Reliving our childhood. And trying to sniff some glue on the side. <laughs> yeah. But also, Chip, it requires patience. Nobody has patience anymore. There was an exquisite uh, ache when you were starting a project with your hands, whether it was a battleship or a, a knitting project or em- embroidery, and you know you were almost done, but not quite, and right. you just couldn't wait to get back the next day. Yes, but yet you did wait the next day. You did, but you weren't distracted by other things, and certainly. And now, if I did something like that, I'd probably be checking my phone all the time, as I do, sadly, even when I read a book on on a weekend and and for three or four hours. That that, or I'll come across a reference to something, and that's actually legitimate, where I can look something up and actually and then, gain greater knowledge. But then, of course, then, yes, you know, want to make sure I haven't checked the New York Post in ten minutes and <laughs> page six. And, and it could be, it could be. Quite could be critical. Yes, yes, it could. Yes, yeah. as I'm reading uh, Sumerian history. Books. Yeah, well, that happens to me all the time, yeah. and to all our listeners. I know that. Indeed. Um, so, to to pivot to what you do into something quite serious, we are a country that is in trouble right now, and I'm not talking about politics. I mean, I always think about politics, but I'm talking about. The kind of loss of um, the kind of loss of first of all feeling good, the loss of uh, resources. We have no resources. We don't use our minds to remember things. We use our phones. If we're feeling sad or bad, we immediately think we're severely depressed, and then we get medicated. We don't have the ability to even discern between levels of bad because there is something about genuine sadness that is a heartbreak, a loss of life, uh, uh, a, a career change that you didn't want. Whatever it is, you can be sad and that is just part of being human. And we don't want to feel things anymore. We're scared of feeling things. We are scared of feeling things. It's very sad in itself. And I think what's happened is that that people have, society expects people to be a certain way or to sort of get it together and get on with their work. I mean, the pressures of work and life are so great now that people feel that they have to be fully functioning at all times, which in some ways is true, but that's really not the way to live. And so that really affects, um, that, that has a great effect on, on people's uh, inability to have momentary pauses, to reflect, to not be distracted, and to do all of the things that we just very naturally did, like you know, looking at the, going down Fifth Avenue in a bus and looking at the beautiful scenery rather than being on your phone and playing words with friends as I did this morning. <laughs> well, and also let me remind you that we had the ability to sit and do nothing, which uh, scientists say is really excellent for the plasticity of the brain. I mean, I spent, I think, all of 11th grade lying on my stomach on my shag carpet, listening to Joni Mitchell and James Taylor. I still got into college. Very good musical choices, by the way. Thank you. And I'm sure you you did. And on on a little stereo, I mean, a little phonograph in a box, not even, you know, hooked up to speakers. Yeah. And I was, I couldn't have been more content. Right, and we, and we listened to an entire album then too, which is very different from what people do today. People oh, sample that's songs right. that there's no, you know, you go on on Spotify and you you can listen to albums, but I think many people don't. Why would you? It's right. so long. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. And also, it's like just reading a chapter of a book and throwing it away. There was kind of a greater good in the whole album. There was a concept for an album. There was a beginning, a middle, and an end to an album. Some of them told stories. Aqualung, because when I think of you, I think of Jethro Tull. There was a... And that particular character, yeah. I hope. <laughs> on Sitting the on a park corner. bench. Yes. <laughs> but, the, but the fact is that you're right. We don't even do things fully. We do things piecemeal now. 
Yes. Because indeed. we can. Yes. We and, skip the B side. And people, even intelligent people who really are well-meaning and who would like to be in that, in that, you know, the Italians call it dolce far niente, which means sweet doing nothing. And that's one of their mantras. And they're really, they're really very good at it, but I'm sure they're on their phones too. But but the world has just gone in that direction. It's really unfortunate because it doesn't allow people to have a breathing space. The one plus of today in regard to mental health is I believe that mental health has been somewhat destigmatized because people use the terms. Maybe they're being sloppy when they say, well, I'm depressed. Maybe they shouldn't because depression is a clinical term that refers to certain certain levels and certain conditions in the brain or biochemistry. I don't know. But I think that people are coming out. Jane Pauley had depression or bipolar syndrome. People are starting to talk about it. Kitty Dukakis talked about it in her electroconvulsive therapy. Um, and wrote a book about and it. And wrote a book about it. That's kind of kind and generous that people, we're all suffering from something, and people are starting to talk about it without the fear that they'll be shunned or feared. Right? That's right. And I, I, but conversation is better than no conversation. Right. Because people, the problem is that people are really actually very socially isolated because of their phones and because they don't, you know, I was reading an article about millennials the other day and that, that many of them feel that they don't have even one or two close friends that they can just call and spend time with. That's something of our generation and that's very tough. And I see it uh, here and there. And that's very, uh, that's very difficult. And so the ability, but the ability to actually think about or, or be knowledge of, of the possibility that you might feel sad is in itself positive. And the, all of these conversations and people coming out about it is true. The problem is that the treatment regimens are, are not as good as they could be. And a lot of people, even though they're not bad, a lot of people are starting to depend because they're on their phones, again, uh, on these mental health apps, which, you know, show you bubbles and, you know, squeaky toys. and Oh, the things that, that are supposed of, to calm you down? Yeah, and, you know, the babbling brook and whatever. All that stuff is good. It's interesting. It's better than nothing. But that doesn't really solve the problem. And I, I just hope that we don't, as a society, like, say, you know, everything, every problem can be solved exclusively by using your cell phone. Well, the Again. cell phone is actually the cause of so much isolation. The digital world is the cause of isolation. I have a young man in my life, a son of friends of mine, who, looking on Facebook and Instagram all day, thinks everybody's having a better time than he is. And he's not the only one who feels that way. That's quite a common idea that people share, FOMO, fear of missing out, or or just envy or self-pity because, yes. but people, of course, are curating and, and refining their pictures of their toes in the sand. They're, they're flossing. That's, th the, that's the expression. Oh. They're flossing. You're so hip. Thank you. Uh, so they're well, flossing. I read Urban Dictionary occasionally. Yeah. So. Yeah. One has to. So they're, so they're flossing. They're creating a false impression and it works. Very much so. And it's very, very challenging. And there really isn't any way around it other than not to look at any of that stuff. And that's very difficult for most people to well, do Well, because you also want to know what's going on in the world. It seems like an, uh, a very legitimate way to find out. Let me ask you, what, do, what does the uh, psychiatric and medical community think about talk therapy? Is that on the increase? Is that on the down-crease, sure. decrease? I think that talk therapy is great. The problem is the commitment and time is tremendous. We are going, you know, in terms of going to an office and speaking to someone, whether it's, you know, anywhere from a licensed social worker to um, a psychologist or up to a psychiatrist who would then be able to prescribe things. Um, it's very difficult for people to commit the time. I think, again, because we're so distracted, actually sitting down with someone and unraveling in the course of an hour and putting that aside and going and doing that consistently is a very challenging task. It would not be the worst thing in the world. There's a lot of telemedicine happening now, and a lot of psychiatrists will be able to, in some states and already can, practice using Skype and, um, and interactive programs. And I think that that's actually where a lot of that's going to go. And there might be, because of that, because of the not having to travel, there might be a lot more. But I think talk therapy is really important. 
uh, even if it's in, in short bursts. Even even the phone or Skype or FaceTime, which is better than nothing, is not the same as actually being in a room with a clinician, though. There are it's things not. about body language and so on that you miss. The subtleties are lost. It's better than nothing, but it's not as good as, as being in. And so that's it, it is really challenging because talk, talk therapy is really important. What about the millennials? Do they do that or are they really trying to get mental health uh, benefits from their phones? I think most of them are trying to get mental health benefits from their phones. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, because they feel that uh, just as, you know, they, they may feel that Instagram is therapeutic or we're looking at something that that distracts them playing games, which can be good, by the way, and that's very good mentally. But it's not enough. Uh, and it really does, in many cases, take the place of, of personal interaction and actually going physically and going and doing things. When I notice how uh, some people, millennials, move around an office, uh, b- b- even physical the physical attributes of an office environment now are lost to to the extent that if you have to go find something it's sort of if it's not in your computer you know it, it might not be there and so it's really it's a quantum shift in thinking and 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 thinking dynamics and the way people interact with each other it's really challenging i also know that on an anecdotal basis people don't go to lunch now i know that doesn't seem like a big deal but if you're sitting alone at your terminal, toddling between your your uh, uh, computer and your phone all day, ordering seamless to your desk, and that's your day, you're missing. You're missing endorphins that you're going to get from being with other people. It's a huge deal. And I actually encourage, I, I, I encourage my employees to go out at least for half an hour, 45 minutes, and take a break. And, you know, then step things up when they get back if they're behind. But the thing is just to, you know, breathe the air and go outside mm-hmm. and do things that are that – are, but, but they usually go independent of each other. But they do communicate in the office, and we have an office setup which encourages that. But, but many, in many office situations, that's not the case. And because, they're, because there's not a lot of privacy and a lot of people wear headphones, and so they really are tuned out to their work. Completely. There's no kind of watercolor uh, – sorry, um, water, water cooler, cooler yeah. environment – uh, I do notice in some offices that people will – there will be sort of a common kitchen where people can at least interact with each other on a short basis and some chairs. If they chairs take their sort of, earplugs out. Exactly. Or if they don't choose to just run back to their desks, which a lot of people do. A lot of people are worried about missing that email or missing that project and keeping – keeping it going. The pace the pace of business is enormous and, and really, really punishing yeah, in many it is. industries. And then, of course, a great attribute for a job for an employer that that people like is they serve food on the premises. Right. It's so, a trick to yeah, make them right. think that it's a perk and what it is is because my son worked at Google that it's just a way to keep you at your desk. <laughs> right, exactly. It's brilliant. It is brilliant. You can afford it. So, how did you get to working? You worked in other fields. You worked at IBM for quite some time in your youth. Uh, how did you get to working in the non-medicated medicine area? Sure. So I discovered this medical device, which is uh, basically in the, the category is cranial electrotherapy stimulation. It's a home use handheld device which uses a mild form of alternating current. You wear, there's a base unit, there are two wires, two sponge applicators, and you wear it with a headband. It's very mild. You and look it, like, may I say, Bjorn Borg when you, indeed. when you wear it. Well, since it was invented in the 80s, it's very appropriate. Oh, so. good. Perfect. <laughs> it's been around a while. So um, you use it to uh, basically once or twice a day to stimulate serotonin, dopamine, and beta endorphin, and also lowers cortisol, the stress hormone. It will induce sleep very quickly. Uh, it also helps trigger REM sleep. We haven't figured out precisely why, but we think it's because the neurons are being uh, excited and certain parts of the brain are being stimulated that will trigger REM sleep, at least at night, Not obviously not when you're using it. And I came across this device really quite by accident through a personal contact. The inventors, one of the inventors had just passed away. My first business partner knew him. He was an addictionologist in a clinical um, 
psychologist and used it in his addiction practice and then wanted to buy the patents to the company and then and do something with it. So we teamed up. That's Fisher Wallace. It was Fisher Wallace Laboratories. And I have a new partner, Kelly Roman, who's been with me to, since 2009. My partner, unfortunately, passed in the first year of our uh, of our business. So, But the, my interest in this came really from a personal level. I mean, I've had seasonal affective disorder my whole life. I haven't had severe depression, but I've had sort of mild to medium depression at different times of the year. It's clinical. It's um, hereditary, runs in my family, and, you know, there it is. So, you know, you either recognize these things or you don't. But obviously, the treatments were not obviously. The treatments were not great. Certainly, when we were in college, uh, there was not a lot of medication, or it was really medication for very severe patients. Um, right. A lot of the, the medications that people take today didn't exist. There was just really you know stuff to sedate you if you were feeling badly yes really heavy stuff so the so the you know the start of that whole um road was really with Prozac and other things that came along after say 1990 mm-hmm. this this device was already on the market but really you know the challenge is we're we're presenting something that's a non-pharmacological alternative doesn't have any serious side effects and it really works for, at a much higher level than medication. And so it's very exciting. And we've sold tens of thousands of these. You know, we're not an enormous company, but we've we've done very well. And it's really exciting because it's giving... So I took all of these drugs. None of them really worked for me. Most of them had very strong side effects. And I noticed that my personality was really very different. Hmm. So on a personal level, I was very excited to see this because I still hadn't solved a problem in 2006. And, and so I guess was, you you tried those lights... Yes. And, and Light therapy has some aspect to it, but it's it, it's also physically you've got to sit in front of it and be disciplined. Right. You can't sort of move around. This you can sort of wear and clip to your pocket and, you know, go and do whatever you want to do. Um, so uh, and, and a lot of people find the lights are a little strong and they're a little annoying, but they do they work. they stimulate you, too. You can't use the lights at night. Right. Exactly. But that works. And EMDR, which is rapid eye movement. Uh, That's another therapy, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. There are different ways to do this. But unfortunately, all of them require time and a lot more discipline to do. And so a lot of people don't necessarily focus on them. Meditation and yoga are also very good at at stimulating endorphins. So, Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of natural, non-pharmacological ways to do this, of which ours is coming really coming to the fore. It's based on very sound principles. I mean, everybody knows about electroconvulsive therapy. It actually does work. There were a lot of things, very positive things said about it in the 1940s and 50s, including in film, long before one flew over the cuckoo's nest. That, unfortunately, you know, was a very negative connotation, and that the connotation of that type of therapy has lasted for many years. The daughter of a friend of mine actually wrote her senior thesis on the effect of that movie which came out in 1973 on people's perception about non-pharmacological. No kidding. Yes. Wow. And so it's really it's really incredibly strong, which is, you know, unfortunate. But Well, it was uh, an Oscar-winning movie, but still, it was enorm- you know, people still swam after jaws. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Some of Most them, people <laughs> these days I wouldn't go in the ocean, but yes, <laughs> we're beginning to see that there are more of those things in the ocean now. So maybe yeah. that's not a great comparison, but Okay. So, but the the thing is that this that the principles are very sound. The problem is electroconvulsive therapy is just too strong, and so there are major side effects of which we actually managed to harness the best aspects of alternating current. Our device is only one to four milliamp. It's a microcurrent as opposed to electroconvulsive therapy, which is eight hundred to a thousand, wow. where, which can induce a seizure and memory loss and all sorts of other things. So the principles are sound. It's just that, and and so this invention is really wonderful because it actually is very safe and easy to use and doesn't have the side effects. Let of, me let me yeah, other things reiterate: you don't lose your memory, you don't go into seizure with Correct. your device. It's safe to use at home. Exactly. And um, studies unsupervised. Have, and studies have indicated that it is actually effective for insomnia and PTSD. Yes, and we recently published on bipolar depression with Mount Sinai Hospital. Wow. A very robust study. And we have we've also done work in the addiction field. We're using this to treat particularly anxiety and insomnia during detoxification, which is where you lose a lot of people. So we did a huge study of about 400 patients at Phoenix House in New York showing that even with a modest number of, of treatments, 
that we were able to reduce insomnia and anxiety so much during detox, which is when people walk out, that they were able to raise their retention rate by 50%. And we're now working with their center in New Hampshire. That's amazing. Saying, yeah. And so this would be a part of the regimen of, at least in the treatment of uh, comorbid mental health symptoms in the addiction sphere. Which So oh. we need to get the people at Hazelden and Horizons and, and all the feelings places in Malibu, they need to know about this device. Indeed. Indeed. And many of them do. And it's coming. I think that, uh, you know, addiction treat the addiction treatment world is really very much of a business. And so solving the problem is best solved when you have patients who are under, who are covered by Medicaid, where there really is an intention to do good things and also to do it in a cost-efficient manner. And so that's where we've come in by getting Medicaid approval in Maine and hopefully soon in New Hampshire. Are you able to advertise? Yes, we are. And yeah. that's 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 it's fine. Nice. We There's do most no... of our advertising on the internet and it's very successful. We understand how Google and Facebook work. Uh, differently and and others other methods and really to and to gain people's interest and have them go to the site watch videos and understand exactly what we do chip what about prescriptions can a can a person find out about your device and then order one or do they need a doctor's note well they don't need a doctor's note but in this country it's an over the counter device everywhere else in the world but the in this country, you just need someone who's licensed for healthcare. So that can be anywhere from a psych uh, from a, you could have an MD down to um, you know a licensed social worker or a psychologist. It's really quite broad. So it so just, in other words, healthcare the office is not as robust as a as an MD script. So it's pretty easy to get. So in other words, you could be a patient of a, a social worker, a licensed social worker, and not have to go to a psychopharmacologist That's to correct. get this and to try it. I mean, it's just another way of helping oneself. It does it does seem like the digital thing is the cause, the digital thing can be the cure, but I it makes me very leery to think of people isolating themselves thinking, well, I can see the world through this little screen, therefore I'm part of the world, and in fact, they're shut-ins or they're hermits or they're they they lack social skills, which would help them have a happier and more fulfilling life. Indeed, indeed, but it's so tempting, and it's tempting to everyone. It's really very few people escape it. Is there a treatment yet for addiction to the phone? There, there isn't specifically. I think that that's really a challenge to get people to do things. They, they have developed this app within the phones now to sort of you know counteract this that tells you how many hours of screen time you have. And if you want to limit your hours of screen time, you what, can 20 set... is too many? <laughs> <laughs> you can You're limit kidding. your screen time yeah. by putting a timer on your phone. Oh. And it'll say, you know, you've done X amount of time for the week. So I'd like to see that it's gone down. And, and consciously, as I use my health app to see how many steps I've walked every day. Right. I do look at those things, and I just try to try to be cognizant, to be to be aware of, mindful of what you're doing and how much time you're spending on the phone. I actually think that we are all kidding ourselves that we are living our lives somewhat in this miniaturized console. I mean, yes. we really are. I am too. I'll read a book. I'll be totally absorbed. And then I hear a little ping from my stupid phone, and I, woo, I leap to it. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And it's, you know what it is? It's a CNN alert saying that um, somebody won a bake-off in, in uh, Idaho. Yes. Well, the funniest thing is always getting a flash flood alert on a bus yeah. or in the subway, and everybody's phone goes off, or in a restaurant. That's yes. really hilarious that we all hear this honking and yes. thinking that it's a, an ambulance going by outside. So it's really, it's remarkable. It's a very different world, and it's we have to fight world. this temptation. It's very, very challenging. Also, I want to say to parents with younger children, the the amount of, I mean, they know this better than we do. But the amount of bullying or one-upmanship or lying or manipulation that goes on with their kids is something 
I am so thrilled not to have had to have dealt with that. Me that too. would make growing up so much more difficult. And, you know, again, going back to where we started the good old days, your parents knew who you were talking to because there was only a landline. So somebody had to say, hi, Mrs. Fisher, may I please speak to Chip? This is Roger. And that would be, you yes. know, th th everybody would know what was going on. It didn't matter. It was, was good to know. There was yes. accountability. Now, who are you talking to? Someone you don't know. That's right. I don't have to tell you. It's my phone. You know, it's it's scary. It is very scary. It is very scary. I, I I'm not we're not I'm not parenting in this age, but yes, I would find that very disconcerting. But yet playing backgammon is not disconcerting. No. And that's <laughs> that's one of your five things. And Chip, what I love about it's it's your job to tell us your five things. But what I love about it is that's something you do with another person. Indeed. Uh, unless you're doing it on a damn app. No. Well, I do play in my app uh, on an There's app. There's backgammon app. There is a backgammon app, but that's really just for training. But the p playing with someone in person is really wonderful and engaging and distracting. And you can't. It's a game which you play, which you really have, like bridge, which my wife plays very well, and w where you really have to be on your game and you really have to focus. You cannot think of anything else because you'll miss something and you'll miss the subtlety in the moves, like with go or chess. And and it can it can turn the game against you. So that's where concentration and focus comes in. And so I, I love it for that reason specifically. When you play backgammon, is your phone on? No, I don't. I never check my phone when I'm playing backgammon. It's really literally off. I literally don't don't have it on, or I don't. If it's on, it's in my pocket. I don't look at it. How often do you get to play? I play once or twice a week with friends at, at a club that I belong to, and I, and but but you can play. I mean, there are a lot of places around the city, and, and that, that are now offering backgammon and chess. It's really coming back. It comes in twenty-year waves. Nobody understands why it was popular in the '40s, and then the '70s, then the '90s, and now, and, and it's really odd. It just comes and goes. Two thousand-year-old game. When I was in seventh or eighth grade, we had a the cool girls in my class of. 20, played backgammon, and some even wow. deigned to play with me. And there was a point in time where I was obsessed with it, and I haven't played since then, and now I don't even think I remember the rules of the oh, game. Oh, I'm sure it'll come back to you. It, it's it's really wonderful, and you can come back to it very quickly. Uh, it's strategic. Yes, very much so. Very easy, easy to learn, hard to master, like Go. So it's deceptive because you think you, you have it, and then as you play... The subtleties just continue to build and build and build. And may I say, even if you don't play backgammon, a backgammon board is a very nice decorative touch to any living room or den. <laughs> it is, indeed. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, what, what's your favorite? Do you have a, a lucite one? Do you have an, a leather one with beautiful, no, shiny Bakelite pieces? I have one with Bakelite pieces, which has a cork board. Cork is very quiet. So I like I don't like hear, hearing the rattle of the the dice. That's rather annoying. So on hard surfaces, that's what happens, whether it's wood or lucite. So cork is sort of an old school traditional. There's still a company up in Providence, Rhode Island that's been making them forever. God bless. And it's the same, you know, beautiful old school kind of boards, and and it's wonderful. So okay, so backgammon, and, and the and the little asterisk is on cork. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay, number two. Watercolors. So I didn't paint as a kid. I didn't. I wasn't that artistic. And and a friend of mine was painting on a trip around two thousand two thousand one. We were in Italy, and and he was painting in watercolors. Not well because he's actually very distracted. And it's, he's one of those. You know, it's like Pugsley on um, <laughs> you know the Adams the family. Adams family and getting you know paint set and he would mix all the colors together that kind of thing. But anyway. But I, but he told me which brushes to. He said, "Get good brushes, get a get a forty eight set, and just try it, and just start and start to draw." And I happen to actually draw well, so drawing helps you structure uh, watercolor b b painting. And then you, w the beauty of it is that you have to really slow down, and less is more, and you have to paint in washes. So you use very little paint, and you really have to experiment in blending paints and trying to uh, create a palette of colors. 
and, and a feeling in the painting. And in my Watercolor stuff... Watercolor is really hard to control. It dries so fast. It does. You, so, I mean, I'm terrified of watercolors. Well, that's why I like it, because it's so hard. It's really a challenge, but also you can travel with a set. That's the beauty. So when I go abroad or wherever I have, you know, a set, sometimes I have one on my desk in case I'm, you know, on the phone, long phone call, and I just want to do something while I'm listening. And and I'll I'll do a little painting of a subject. I'll take pictures of things in my phone, and then I'll paint them later on. Mm-hmm. So it's actually very, it's very soothing, like doing models or playing back. I mean, it's to sort of really get your mind off other things. And you can't be distracted because otherwise, again, you'll lose touch or you'll um, you'll make a mistake. So that's what it kind of brings you back. What do you do with all the paintings you have? I usually give them to friends. I, I do a lot of postcards and I send them, you know, from different parts of the oh, world. Oh, how I lovely. I send them around the world. So, uh, cool. Yeah, it's really fun. I save some of them. Do you frame any of them? I do some of them, yeah. Yeah, the better ones. But I actually prefer to just give them away because I do enough of them so that if there's something really special and I've painted actually pictures of my of parts of my apartment and I've then put the picture in front of the actual oh, that's know, cool. place over the fireplace or whatever. It's kind of people find that very entertaining. So it's cool. Fun. It's really anyway, and it's a way to unleash creativity and to co- and to concentrate and to get away from my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I see a pattern. Do you? Number three, licorice. What kind of licorice? Um, really, across the board. I mean, there are so many. There are hundreds and hundreds of different types of very good licorice. And there's only actually there's only one store in New York that sells them still. It has a variety. It's called Mizell's. It's on 55th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue. It's been there forever. They have 50 or 100 different types. And for some reason, licorice is not very popular in the United States. Because it's, it's not taste. sweet enough? Is that why? Well, there are sweeter versions. I mean, Good and Plenty is really the only licorice candy. But right. Americans just don't have that the, the taste buds. For some reason, there's a certain part of the world, maybe it's damper in some Somewhere between, you know, let's say Holland and Finland, which right. is where licorice is very popular. Licorice capital of the world. Very much so. Well, Finland, it's you know, you can't licorice go two is steps. to Finland what uh, you know ice skating is to um, you know Canada. So, wow. Yeah, they're it's really a national intense. pastime. It is, and they and they and have obsession. all of these right, and they get really deep into very salty, very unusual licorices, and they have licorice tastings and. You know, it's 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 amazing, but it's just it's sort of off the charts. I love chocolate too, and I love candy generally, but licorice just has something very special to it and very unique. And I don't have a lot of company uh-huh. and people that I can talk to about this. It's very few people like it. That's but it's probably wonderful. why you came here. Maybe just to talk. There you go. I yeah, needed to... I needed to let this out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll help you find Please. your community of licorice lovers. Indeed, um, I don't need detox though. It's yeah, fine. yeah. Okay, good. Now licorice, there's good and plenty. I really get offended when people consider Twizzlers licorice, and I'm going to just say this now. I know a million people who love Twizzlers. To me, there is no flavor or taste in a Twizzler. I have, I mean... Uh, it's ghastly. It's not I don't licorice. get it. It's like a fruit roll-up without a flavor, and it sticks to your teeth. Now, some people might like the mouthfeel of Twizzlers. Well, they do like the mouthfeel. It's still, it's very popular, and they like the red ones especially. But but it's very artificial. It's very far from the, the actual licorice, what's truly licorice. And it's just... But, but they seem to... Look, American candy is very unique, and when you hit it, it really sells. For example, the top 10 candy bars have been the same with the exception of one or two candy bars since World War II. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, and the only company that can actually is bright enough to slip something in would be Mars. Wow. Which Snickers, which is one of the replacements for something else that came in 1971. A Snicker Snicker bar is a good bar. It is a good bar. It is a good bar. I'm not a snob about, about... Chocolate, as so many of our peers are, I, I can I could really eat a Snicker at any time. I could eat a um, I could eat a Twix. Twix is nice, but you know you know what's interesting about about chocolate I'm is enjoy. that people um, in this country actually used to eat dark chocolate the way Europeans do. Well, they Before, are again. They are again, but Hershey really developed milk chocolate. That was a whole. He, he turned that into an industry. Before that, everyone in this country ate dark chocolate. People think that Americans only ate 
milk, milk chocolate. Yeah. But he really just invented, uh, just changed everyone's wow. taste. Yeah, it was okay. extraordinary. Well, just just to put a, a a little bow on top of it, what is your favorite licorice that you can My, buy in New York so that other people who might be listening who live here or are coming through can find it? I don't remember the brand name, unfortunately, but um, I, I have so many different ones. My favorite one is actually, uh, there's a sort of a chewy rectangle, which is not too sweet, but a little sweet. It's, it's hard to find. But um, you can go to this um, liquor store on 55th Street and find that and a whole bunch of other things, including, you can, well, they won't let you stand there and taste everything, but they, they'll give you a few. And it's just, it goes anywhere from salty to sweet to soft to hard, whatever. So, And what's the difference other than decor- decoration between a black licorice and a red licorice? I don't really know because I don't eat red licorice because I think that that's sort of, in a way, a, a little bit of an abomination. So I've been a black aficionado. I cannot speak with knowledge. <laughs> I'm afraid. I, fair I, enough. Take a pass on that. A hard pass. <laughs> hard pass. Okay. Number four. Wet dogs. Okay, wait. Okay, wait. Like a dog that's wet. That's right. A wet dog. Yes. There's okay. something wonderful about a wet dog. Not, not that I... I have a dachshund. I don't just throw her in the tub and let her run around the apartment. <laughs> I just don't get that impression. Okay. But there's something wonderful about a dog being in its natural state and then eventually drying off in some fashion, whether it's by your by the owner's hand or themselves, mm-hmm. that they just are able to kind of let loose and be themselves, which when, is very difficult in New York. When I had my beloved dog, Henry, after I would bathe him, I would, uh, you know, uh, wrap him in a towel, swaddle him basically, and and start sort of rubbing him dry. And then he would leap out of my arms and roll around on the bath mat. And he didn't look like a dog. He looked, I always thought he looked like a little wild boar. Very cute. But he'd roll and roll and roll and roll. And then he would stand very proudly while I blow dried him. Oh, that's wonderful. But I didn't, you know, I don't like wet dogs in a way because a lot of wet dogs smell bad when they're wet. Yes. Not champ- not freshly shampooed, but in the rain or in a puddle or something. I'm, 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 I tend towards the more curated version, which is, yes, after a wet dog after shampoo in a sink, which is big <laughs> enough to hold them. That's more my style. Gotcha. Yes. Okay, let's not, be not, very specific. Not the Labrador. Yeah. Uh, that comes you know, in from... Fils, the... Out in the field with Filson and the shotgun and everything <laughs> else. That's not my thing. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And speaking of dogs, number five. Hot dogs. Yeah. Well, you and I grew up going to the Temple of Hot Dogs, Papaya King, which is at 86th Street and 3rd Avenue, which is... And I, it's in my will that I'd like to be cremated and have my ashes... <laughs> <laughs> um, cast over that establishment. Oh, that is touching. It will give touching. me true peace. I don't want to be in some little park with birds chirping. I want the horns honking Third Avenue. Now, the uh, thing about... Uh, <clears throat> I love hot dogs, too. I like Franks and Blanks. How are you on those? Good. good. Very good? good. Yes. Love them. Okay. How are you about... Uh, you know, Papaya King... I, I know what I'm about to say is controversial, but Papaya King doesn't toast the buns they don't anymore i th- I, I had they do yeah they did? i had thought i had i had toasted buns the other day i think it depends on how busy they are if they're really crazy they won't toast the buns but for the last time i was there which was maybe within the last month they did and i don't you know i don't go that often but um, a toasted bun is is important yes and there's something about you know when people are aficionados about a particular subject of which they are happen to be one not the not that that's the only place to get them, but but that they have their own formula and they worked on it over the years and the crunch is right and you have that crispness between the, the casing and, the, and, the, and what's inside. It's just incredible. It's just yeah. the perfect American food when it's great and when it's done well. I'm so impressed. Thank I'm you. really impressed that you've made a study of it. 
Thank you. Uh, well, that's that's what of, you do. I'm neurotic enough to do that sort of thing. <laughs> you know what? Nora Ephron had a, uh, you know, she loved to write about food. She loved food. And she wrote about a hot dog that she thought was the perfect hot dog that she used to buy at Say Bars. I'm not sure if it had, it was, it was... It was a beef hot dog. It wasn't a kosher hot dog, but the casing was something that she talked about the snap. Yes, it's the snap. That's that's it. It's the mouthfeel. That's the industry term since I used to be in the food business. Yes, mouthfeel. Yes. Mouthfeel. Yes. Okay. It's Can I just say one last thing? I love your list. I love talking to you. Thank you. But I would like to just have one 30 seconds on the greatest pizza slice that ever existed in New York. That was Tony's Have a Pizza on 86th Street in Lexington. Another shrine of our youth. Oh, I'm geshrying about our youth. <laughs> and that was 25 cents or 50 cents when we... Yes. Well, oh. uh, 15 cents originally. Back in the day, the cost of a slice actually always completely mirrored the cost of going in the subway which people don't know today. And it may be still at some places close to it, around $3 for a plain slice in some places, although that's inexpensive in some. And this fellow was there for years and years and years. He actually moved to New Jersey. He still has a place somewhere um, in the suburbs of New Jersey. Tony, he, we're looking for you. We are. I think it's Hohokus. And I actually spoke to him about 20 or 30 years ago. He may not. He may be retired. I would I would hope so now. He must be. <laughs> he's, he's got to be he's 90 earned or 100. It. He's, he's definitely earned, earned it. it standing in front of those ovens. And so, but the beauty of his store, which he actually explained to me on the phone, was that he made pizza in the window. Yes. And you could see him flipping his pies. You and could. so that, even though the location was sort of challenged by being in front of a subway station, you saw him in action. And that drew people into the store. And he had these enormous pies, which have shrunk over the years. Um, you know, they're, they're smaller. The slices are smaller. You could we had... maybe manage to, one could maybe, a hungry person could maybe manage two whole slices. I did, I did actually, uh, full confession, manage to polish off an entire pie with a friend of mine, but he was six five. Oh. So he may have gone five to my three slices. Yeah, right. So I think I may not have, you know, matched him. But you're right. Yes. In general they were huge. They were and, huge. And, and they, they were, were beautifully so, done. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. Because he had a great um mother yeast and the, which he'd had for many, many years and that's why pizza gets better and better. Boy, was that good. Including this thing in the in the Times about somebody making bread out of 4,500-year-old yeast yesterday. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. 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 Well, Glad, I just missed... Sorry, they waited so long. Yeah. What's your rush? <laughs> I, I really love that. That was my first pizza that I ever had in my life. And, and I, I think still I, remember what it tastes like. I do, too. It's incredible. It had a, a piquancy yes. to it. Yes, yes. Well, Very fresh and lots of tomato sauce. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Well, here's to you. Here's to Tony. I feel like toasting him. And thank you, Chip, so much for joining us today. And really fun talk and really important talk. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Chip Fisher, chairman of Fisher Wallace Laboratories. His website can be found at fisherwallace.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. My blog is at lisabirnbach.com, where you'll find links and photos about all the things we talked about today. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is pancake-loving Jimmy Regan. My team is Espresso Rucci, Michael Port, and Sam Haft. Until next week, stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.